Can you see it better? So, first of all, I'm Raj, and I'm a PhD student here at the marketing department. So today, I'll be talking to you about family, family consumption, transitions, and also I'll talk to you about a little bit about my own research as well. So let's uh, get started. First of all, today, we will talk about what family is, how family is different from a household, and also we'll talk about what is the importance of family in terms of consumption, in terms of marketing. We will talk about what family identities, what uh, family transitions, and also what are family life stages. Then finally, at the later stages of this lecture today, uh, probably last few minutes, I'll talk to you guys about my own research. You see, it's also about family transitions. Now, what is a family and what is a household? A family is two or more individuals living together under one roof who are related by blood or by marriage. Now, on the contrary, a household can have one individual. Even one individual can be household. They don't have to be related to each other. For example, you guys living with your flatmates, or you can be considered as a household, not a family. But that's the difference between a family and a household. Now, when we hear the word family, we understand family in different ways. But let me explain you that in the second part. Here, when we talk about families, we have different kinds of families. First, we have nuclear families. We have extended families, and also nowadays, increasingly, we come across single parent families. Now, what's a nuclear family is one or two individuals, or parents, children, and even a pet. It's a small unit. At the same time, the extended family have three or four generations, or three generations at least, living together under one roof. In an extended family, that is the significance. And this is this used to be quite popular those days. And also single parent family is also quite popular these days. And I will talk to you about single parent families and why it is changing in the next uh, several slides. Now, when we hear the word family, we understand and perceive family in different ways, depending on where we come from. The thing is, countries like Canada, Western countries, even here. When we hear the word, we understand, we have referred to a nuclear family. But in countries like Thailand, when we hear the word family, we understand, we think about our extended family. For example, when I hear the word, I think about my grandparents, my siblings, my parents, and even my cousins and uncles and aunts. Because in Sri Lanka's context, it is an extended family that we refer to as a family. Now, why family is so important to us? Why is it important to market? Why is it important to consumption? It provides, it gives us financial resources, provides us economic, provides us economic well-being. Your parents feed you, gave you clothes, sent you to university, spent for your education. So it gave, they gave you financial support, but it is not alone enough for a human being. What you need is families, what families also give us, emotional support gives us love, makes us feel secure. So that is also an important thing that families give us. Now when we think about consumption and marketing, family, family is also important because it teaches people, especially the young generation, how to become consumers, how to consume. It gives us, it shapes our attitudes, perceptions, motivations, it also defines our symbolic meanings, core values, specific, uh, character. It teaches us what are the acceptable consumption practices. So like this, family trains us to be consumers. Now that is called consumer socialization, the process of teaching children how to become consumers, how to consume. That is called consumer socialization. Now, Consumer socialization is an important function of family, and family alone is not the only agent or source that provides consumer socialization, like I will discuss. 
friends play an important part as well. Then also marketing, advertising, sales people, all these things teaches us how to become consumers. But here today we talk about families, how family is important in this process. Now here in this picture, if you can see clearly here, uh, you see a family member, a young person, how a family member defines it. It teaches you moral, religious principles. If, uh, it teaches him what are acceptable interpersonal behavior. Gives him educational or career motivations, growth. Now, some of you guys might have followed your parents' footprints here at the university to be a doctor, an engineer, or whatever it is that you want to pick up. And also, it teaches us what are the acceptable types, let's say, brands that we should consume. Then at the same time, when kids grow up, when they become teenagers, get older, you guys may know that your friends as role models to think about what is the acceptable consumption practices to your age, to your context. So by looking at your friends, you decide that this is the kind of style that I'm going to wear at the university. This is the kind of clothes, this is in, this is out, these kind of things. Now why the family or the parents are important in this process of consumer socialization? There are three things that I have uh, summarized here. One thing is parents uh, directly influence new attitudes, perceptions, things like this, like I mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago. At the same time, they provide the role models which children can observe and learn. That's why when you see like, we learn how to become consumers or what are the acceptable brands, acceptable brands, what are the things that we should do by observing our parents, how they consume, how they use things. Then at the same time, family or the parents play an important role by controlling how much of an exposure children get to other kinds of socialization agents, to friends, salespeople, like this. So this is why parents play an important central role in the consumer socialization process. Now, there are just different, so many decisions that families make in their daily lives. Some of these decisions are very important, uh, important, uh, serious decisions, but some are just everyday, mundane, ordinary decisions. But whatever it is, in your text, it summarizes there are two kinds of decisions. One thing is a consensual purchase decision, the other one is an accommodative purchase decision. Now, a consensual purchase decision usually is about, well, household members would agree on something but they would not agree on how they go by getting it done. For example, you might agree on, well, we are going on a vacation or holiday. But you might disagree on where you go, what you do, things like this. Now, in this kind of decision, what families do is engage in a uh, decision, uh, or engage in a problem-solving process, like uh, until they, guess, uh, they come up with uh, a solution where all family members can agree. But in contrast, accommodative purchase decisions, family members would not agree on a particular consumer decision or a particular family decision. Therefore, it will initiate some tension, conflict regarding that decision. Now, that's when parents will have to, okay, so families will have to use techniques like compromising, bargaining, even coercing. Now, there are conflict and tension in these decisions. That's, that's what's what we need to understand here. But what, there are things like, uh, there are factors that influence, or that, um, uh, that contribute to tension and conflict in family decisions. Uh, for example, like you can see in this slide, and this is in our text actually, interpersonal needs, product involvement, utility, responsibility, and power. Now, interpersonal needs is how much of an involvement you have in that family will influence how much tension and conflict on a particular decision. For example, now, some of you guys flatting, living here away from your parents. So therefore, it doesn't matter to you guys what kind of bread your parents have in the morning for breakfast, what kind of milk they have. It doesn't really matter to you guys because you are away from them. But when you go home for the weekend, go home for the same or so on, now it matters to you, say, oh, I don't like this kind of bread, I don't like this milk, it's not good for me, it's allergic for me, whatever it is. So that is the interpersonal, that is the involvement. Then also you have product involvement utility, which means the 
let's say you have a brand of coffee that you really like, you love it, it makes you wake up in the morning. But your parents say, like, it's expensive, we are not going to buy that, perhaps we should try the other brand, which is less expensive, but it's also at the same quality, but you don't like it. So that tends to have a bit of a conflict, I mean, conflicting interest. And that is called the product involvement utility. There are also decisions that entail responsibility for a certain period of time or longer period of time after that particular decision, which might create tension and conflict as well. There's also power creates tension and conflict because uh, let's say there are times that parents make decisions on their own. They might not have consensus. The still, um, these kind of decisions are pretty much, it happens every day in the families. Parents make these kind of decisions. Sometimes they are important decisions as well. But what I'm saying is, power also a factor, they might contribute to conflict and uh, tension in the families as well. Right. So, what is the role of children in family decision making? Now we know children has been targeted for the last couple of decades to consumption of the marketing and advertising. Children are quite important, a quite central place in families as well. But that is why companies advertising is targeting children to, through their advertising to become target markets, chocolate, Canada, chocolate, uh, toys, these things. Kids actually are the target market for some products like this. But at the same time, you have a kids owning influence markets, which means kids influence parents' decision making. Why, for example, how many of you have seen kids in the supermarkets or shopping malls whining and crying and telling parents what to buy? My friends have it. My uncle has it. Why don't we have this? It's pretty cool. It's in that movie. We see this also, right? And that is the way that children form the influence markets. And also, it's a great form, but there's also, when there's children in the house, parents Priorities sometimes change as well. For example, when you have young children, safety is an important factor when you travel, when you pick the car. So that is another way how children influence their decision making. Then also, children form future markets. What that means? If the company, imagine the company can instill brand loyalty in children as early as, 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 early as possible. This child will grow up consuming this product with brand loyalty. He will consume this. At the same time, who knows, he may bring along some of his friends as well. So that forms the future markets as well. So according to research, such as children start consuming on their own since the age of five. And also there's this research as such as <coughs> children start influencing family decision making process since the inception. So it is important, very important to understand. That is why researchers are quite interested in families, or especially children as well. Right, now, what is family identity? Now, before I talk about family identity, let me explain you what is identity. Now, identity is who we are. My identity is who I am, what I think about myself. But at the same time, it's also about how I do things, what kind of things are, are I do when I in my initial time, how I talk to you, how I present myself, all these things is part of my identity. Same thing for families as well. So family identity is who we are as a family. It is constructed in family members' heads, of course. But at the same time, it's constructed between family members as well, from uh, with the things that they do in their everyday lives, as well as in relation to their social sphere, their friends, relatives, in what we do, how we do things. This is family identity. So therefore, family identity is how we um, sit for family dinner, what kind of food we consume, how we go on vacation, what we do in our initial time. So this is all part of family identity. So therefore, family identity is defined as family's subjective sense of who they are. It's past, present, future. It's a collection of qualities, character traits, 
So this is family identity. But there's a problem with it. Because um, most of the family identity frameworks have looked at family identity in terms of individuals from a singular perspective. Now, why I say it's a problem, it goes uh, diff it's difficult to understand how family is consumed by looking at a singular perspective. Now that is why we look at this model called layered family identity model, which means that each family has a collective layer. As you can see in the picture, uh, you have a collective identity which was an adventurous family, maybe a Christian family, maybe a, a Buddhist family, or whatever it is. There are so many means like this. Maybe drawing from social cultural means, maybe drawing from means that are relevant or important to your family, family traditions. So still forms an overarching collective layer. But at the same time, there are relational and individual layers. Now relational layers are groups within the family. You have mother and father, siblings, sisters and brothers, or then you have mother and father, mother and daughter, father and son. This is the relational groups. Then you also have individual. Individual identity is also important in the family. Now in the relational data, there are interactions <coughs> between these groups or within these groups. Father and son, baseball practices. Mother and daughter, shopping, weekend shopping. Now these things are important things when it comes to the family identity according to this model. Now don't get me wrong, it doesn't suggest that both relational data and the individual data fits nicely into the collective layer. No, it's not that what it's suggesting. What it says is, it's very important to understand the interactions between these layers in order to understand how families negotiate their identities and how they arrive on what is acceptable consumption practices for this particular family. Right. Now, I'll explain you what is the family life cycle. Now, family life cycle is a concept that is constructed using family composition, how many members in the family, <coughs> income and spending potential. It assumes that we families go through a particular set of stages as time goes on. As you can see here in this picture, you have we start with being a bachelor, we get married, become partners, then we have children, become parents. Then we raise our children, they move away, they go to university or they get married, then finally the family will, go, will be, that, that particular family will be dissolved and the children will move on and start their own family and this life cycle will go on. But there's a flow, you know, that this, there's insufficiency in this model to actually understand current trends, current social trends, what's happening in our society today. Because it actually fails, it doesn't really account for increasing rates of or decrease increasing rates of uh, divorce. And less people actually get married in the Western societies today. More people actually cohabit. And there are same-sex marriages. So these things are not counted in the traditional model. And there are alternative, these are alternative stages. So that's why if you can see in this picture. You have in the middle, the middle that you have traditional stages that you are expected to go through in your normal life. But at the same time, in blue and yellow, you have uh, other, some other alternative stages. If you can see in the middle here, you have middle age divorce with children. And that's an alternative stage. So, what I want you guys to understand is it is important that we look at this family life cycle, but there are also alternating stages that we need to consider when we think about uh, today's society. Why? Because the thing is, for example, let's think about just like this. Young married without children, the second yellow box. Now here, this couple, young, their uh, values might be different, they both might have income, so their uh, spending potential is quite good, so they might go um, holidays pretty much twice a year. But when they have children and move into young married with children boss, now they will reduce their expenses, they will cut down their expenses and they will try their car use will change. So like this, from stage to stage, how they consume <coughs> what is important to will change. For example, older married couples no longer mortgage, no more mortgage, no more car payments, children will be gone, they will be and so therefore 
they, they will go to luxurious vacations. I'm just saying this because for you guys to understand what is the difference from each stage to stage. Why is this important for consumption and marketing? For example, as you can see in this particular advertisement, it targets fathers with young children because their concern is about safety when it comes to a vehicle. But it's saying, you don't have to compromise for safety. You don't have to compromise performance. That is the message it's trying to get through. Right. Moving from one stage of spending to another is a transition. A transition is a change, a permanent changeover of a set of expected beliefs to another. But transition is a change from one stage to another. There are several transitions like this in our lives. We go through so many transitions like this, to be honest. Becoming a teenager, starting university, some of the first years out here are in a transition. Starting a university, moving away from your parents. Getting married is one of the major transitions which I am studying for my PhD. <coughs> Having a child. So like this, there are so many transitions that we go through in our lives. In research, it talks about so many different transitions. It talks about naturally occurring transitions, intentional transitions, now becoming a teenager is a naturally occurring transition. Decide or undecided, voluntary or involuntary, getting married is a decide, hopefully. Divorce, getting divorced, which is not. So like this, there are various transitions that's been explored in uh, consumer culture, so consumer culture research. Now, why transitions are important? One of the reasons is transitions changes who we are, our identity. It gives us an opportunity to actually change who we are and become new people, which is better for our new lifestyle. Now that is why transitions are important in terms of identity as well. Now what I studied in my research is actually how this identity changes from one point to another. I'll explain to you in a minute. Um, so, like I said, transitions causes our identities to change from one point, one, from one person to another. For example, let's say, <coughs> anybody like to play computer games when you were little or when you were home? Well, yeah, let's say one of you guys like to play computer games when you were able to at home. You define yourself as a computer gamer, maybe a particular game that you really like. You brag to your friends about this. But then, when you decided to come to university and start university, you thought about it. Then what happened, this identity became little unanswered. That's what explains really here in this second circle, is unanswered. Um, what it means is, it becomes open to negotiation, open to change. Because now you are not sure how your university life will be. How your new friends will perceive this. Will they like it? Will, will they like it? Will they laugh at you? And how your university coursework will be? Will you be too busy? And what have kind of time to pay for your things? So this is uncertainty a little bit for you. And you don't know how it's going to be. So your identity becomes, that particular identity becomes an anchor. And therefore, then you come to the university. You come here, you meet people, you meet someone, start dating, your priorities change, then your coursework is quite hard and you have to get into studies and you don't have time to take a few anymore. You might still want to get back, but you still don't have time. Now that's, then you define yourself as I said, a rugby player now, because you have your friends think it's cool, and so you go on to play rugby and you want to define yourself as such. And that, now think about it. You started from one point, being a computer, someone who loved computer games, and changed into someone who loved running. And that defined part of your identity, your self, sense of self. And transformational routine means where you started, where you ended, and how you, how you change your identity through that time, during that time. And that is called the transformational routine. You might change because, you're, because of your friends, to think it's cool by the way that you wear, from the, way, from the things that you do. These are the things that you do in order to change, and that is called the transformational routine. Now, this is what I'm going to talk to you about theory today. And what I'm going to talk to you next is about my own research. But let me just summarize what I talked to you today. First, we started by talking about family. What is family, what is household, why it is important to consumption and marketing. 
There are talk, I spoke to you guys about family transitions, family life cycles. So this is why family is important to consumption. I, I hope that you guys are a bit clear today why is family, understand what family is now. Right, so let me explain you what my research is about. The topic, as you can say, is setting up for identity interplay and consumption in new family household. Let me explain you very simply what it is. It means when two individuals get married, two people come together, they, realize, they, they negotiate their identity, do a lot of things together, and form a new family, a family identity. They form new consumption practices. And what I studied was how they did that, how their identities changed, what are the things influence this process. This is my research. So when I refer to identity, I refer to something called material objects and material practices. Because when I refer to identity, I was thinking about, I was, I was going to study people's symbolic meanings, people's core values, their perceptions and attitudes, or their first characteristics, character and attitudes, then also their expectations, future expectations and ambitions, and then also their important practices and routines. These are the things that I study on the identity. But it's difficult to actually see these things. I didn't want to just go and ask them about these things, but I want to study how these things change. Because sometimes people, when you go through a transition, you are not aware that you are going through a transition. So therefore, I want to experience this from the um, experiences. So therefore, I looked at material objects, the things that they use, their favorite things, and the things that they did. And these things provided me the lens to understand how their identity changed over time. Now that's what I say here. Symbolic consumption practices. Now for example, um, the guy here with the graduation, <coughs> his future ambition was to actually become a bachelor's essential surgeon. He already had a dental degree. He was pursuing his medical degree. So he was actually going to the university. He wanted to go to the university to study, uh, to become a facilitation surgeon. And he expected his wife to support him after, the, after getting married. Then there are also these family panels, important material objects I looked at. There were, uh, there were objects that was passed on from one generation to generation and ended up with my, uh, my informants. And they loved these things. They want to take these things to their own families. And there were also objects, like favorite objects, oh, uh, like hobbies. So these hobbies were like you're playing guitar, as you can see. Now this guy actually wanted to have a, uh, learn more about playing guitar and also want to organize musical events, things like this as well. So these are symbolic consumption practices, practices and objects that are more emotional. They are more emotional about. Now they didn't have a problem articulating these things to me, talking, talking, talking about these things with me. But I also understood, I also want to study about how they negotiate their identities through everyday, mundane, ordinary things, like sharing space, family space. How do you sit when you watch TV in your family, in your new family? How you shop, how you prepare meals, how you display your furniture. These are very mundane, ordinary things, but very important to how people negotiate their identities. But it's difficult to actually look at these things by just talking to them. Because, for example, some of most of these couples didn't even tell me these things because they didn't know they are, those are important to me as a researcher. But that's why I adopted a methodology called ethnography. Now, ethnography is a uh, research that is being historically used in cultural anthropology to study cultures. Now, consumer research also used this method. In consumer research also we use this. And in my ethnography, it was a two-stage ethnography. First, I spoke to couples before they get, get married. I went and asked them, why, what are the important things? that you want to take to your new family? What are the things that you want to continue when you get married? So, and how do you think your partner will react to this? So I ask these kinds of uh, projective questions from them. And they haven't even thought about these things that I just asked them. So it got them actually thinking when I asked them. 
So then I came to New Zealand, uh, started uh, uh, editing and uh, just analyzing my data based on the first round. Then I went back to Sri Lanka and most of these couples were married at that time, was taking some time. So then I asked them, okay, have you brought these objects now? The object that you want to bring. Have you brought that so far with you? How did your husband like that? And uh, how, if he didn't like it, how did you guys negotiate? How, how did you guys negotiate this? So like this, this is the kind of knowledge that I wanted to actually get from them. Now, <coughs> Let me talk to you about the research contributions. Now, I have several research contributions, but today I'm going to talk to you about uh, two things, two important, uh, two research contributions that I have already developed. One thing is about sharing, and the other thing is something called transformative activity. I'll explain to you in a minute. But now, sharing is an important form of consumption, especially that, that happens in other families, in other homes. And that's why I want to emphasize some sharing a little bit. So you guys will be thinking how sharing forms an important habit consumption practice. Right. Now here in this picture, you can see, I'll explain to you. Now here, this is my entire PhD. Now here, I talk about two individuals coming together. You have individual identity. Is you are individual identity. Then what I do is, I look at material practice. Now this, this lens is actually the material practice and object which I use to understand <coughs> And I suggest that by going through this negotiation process, individual identities become <coughs> part of family identity, layer family identity. Now this negotiation process is my research contribution. Here I talk about something called transformative ambiguity. I'll talk to you, I'll explain it to you in the next slide. Then we negotiate transformative ambiguity by learning to share, by <coughs> tolerating how people not share their things as well. It's not just the sharing, it's how they not share and how you cope up, how you negotiate not sharing as well. Then these processes create tension and conflict in families. But what I'm focusing today is about transformative ambiguity and sharing. Now this is about the transformative ambiguity. Now at the bottom, you can see it's called the state of transformative ambiguity. Now ambiguity is a state. Now let me explain you what ambiguity is and why I'm talking about ambiguity when the previous, one of the previous slides about that transformation of talk talked about uncertainty. Because not research on transitions talk about uncertainty. If they talk about transitions as a certain stage of uncertainty, and, but uh, but my experience was something a little bit more. There was naive expectations or naivety. There were um, multiple expectations. And these couples were uncertain when they said, well, I want my family to be like this. If they were uncertain, they were naive. And also, they had multiple interpretations about a specific object, about a specific practice. So, I call it ambiguity. And I call it, it's, it's a state, it's a state that we experience in the transition. And I call it transformative ambiguity because going through this process, negotiating transformative ambiguity, uh, negotiating ambiguity, individuals become, the individuals are transformed from one person to another. So that's why I call it transformative ambiguity. Now as you can see here, individual identity, you can be a son, a chef, a professional identity, you can be a friend. So whatever it is, when you marry or when you come in a family together with another individual, you form naive expectations. For example, I had one of my female influence. She had lots of empty furniture she got from her parents. And she said, Prabash, I want to actually take this furniture to my new house. And I think my husband will be okay with it. But what happened during the realization stage? When they started talking about these things, where are we going to go after we get married, how are we going to live, and whatever is the house we going to live, things like this. When they started talking about these things, she realized that his husband didn't like antique furniture. He likes uh, modern stuff. And also, they were not going to move out actually, they were going to move in with uh, his father. So there, she realized, now there's a conflict. 
then it propelled them, it compelled them to actually negotiate these means, the differences. And in another chapter, actually this sharing and not sharing is a different chapter, but here I, 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 I discuss the sharing and not sharing is an important process that how they negotiate these differences. So they did a lot of talking, sharing, compromising, bargaining, all of these things, and then they negotiated whatever suited for them. For example, this couple decided, well, we're going to bring a couple of items, a warm cup and a dressing table. So they brought these things set up in their room, and that is how they negotiated this particular uh, situation. But what I'm saying here is, by negotiating these differences, the couple understood about each other more and more. Now that's the thing. Ultimately, these objects leave the household, definitely, because they are not going to last forever. But what matters, what I am focusing here is how they constructed that understanding about each other and how it made their relationship more stable and comfortable for each other. Now what I mean is, see the girl understood when her husband doesn't like antiques for the first thing, and also he's more caring. He can be convinced if I remain persistent. She understood these things and same thing about him. He understood that antiques matter to her. But why antiques matter to her is because her family ancestry, family pride, these things are quite important to her. And she's quite persistent as well. She knows how to get what she wants. So he understood these things as well. Now this is the understanding I'm talking about. This is important. Now let's say they move on this, they, they move on from this situation and then they face something else, a situation with their uh, egos. In that situation, we suggest that the couples go through the same ambiguity negotiation process again, perhaps, but next time when they confront something like this, now they know more about each other. They are starting from a better point, better position about each other, which makes their family more stable and solid. And that is actually my contribution, which I want to talk to you today. And finally, let me explain you a couple of important, summarize the important contributions of my research. So, first, I talk about ambiguity. I take the word ambiguity and reconceptualize this as a positive state that we experience during transitions. It is frequently discussed in many uh, disciplines as a negative thing. I talk about it as an essential state that we need to go through during the transitions. Now the thing is, I'm not saying that previous research didn't go ignore ambiguity and they didn't find, I'm not, I'm not saying that I did this. What I'm saying is, previous research may not have come across ambiguity because they study transitions mostly about individuals. In my research, what I study is two individuals coming together in a family, two worlds coming together with different attitudes, different goals, meanings. So these two individuals come together and try to form a shared family identity. And that's why I think I experienced more ambiguity, something more than uncertainty, because why we came across this, uh, why we developed this world, we couldn't explain a lot of things what we experienced, experienced through uncertainty. And that's why I think we experience more uh, ambiguity rather than uh, um, uncertainty. So as then again, uncertainty is part of ambiguity as well. So the second point and final contribution is sharing. Now sharing, like I mentioned before, is an important form of family consumption. Like you see, your parents share their things. I mean, when you live with your parents, you didn't own them. It wasn't yours. Let, let me just say that. Let me just say this. So, your parents share these resources with you guys, and that is the sharing. It's not just about sharing a pen or sharing the furniture. It's about sharing time, sharing values, ideas, attitudes, sharing space. Uh, that is why sharing is quite important in families. We share things in families. But the thing is, when it comes to sharing research, literature, most of it's actually conceptual. And it hasn't been studied how sharing influences identity, identity negotiation, identity formation. And in my research, I studied how sharing is important in forming, extending ourselves through family members. 
An extended cell also requires time in the individual layer, so this allows time in extended cell, how we extend ourselves to family members. <coughs> now, this is my research. And I'm quite excited about these things, actually. I'm in my final years, I final few months. <laughs> so today, I'm really happy, actually, I got a chance to come and talk to you guys about my research. It was a good opportunity for me. So thank you very much. And, uh, and if you guys have any questions regarding just the previous slide,